I don't want to uh, come on as uh, leading the anti-science charge. I think science has its place. The problem that I meet, and I also spend a fair bit of time with scientists, and the good ones there's no problem with because the good ones operate fully in the light of the philosophy of science and the history of science. They know what they're doing. But the workaday bench scientist uh, tends to be extremely doctrinaire and extremely intolerant of what he regards as uh, thinking not as rigorous as his own. However, uh, most scientists are not philosophers of science and they suffer therefrom because science is a historical phenomenon. It arose with the Greeks and developed through the Arabs in the Middle Ages and into its modern phase. Like all historically evolved human institutions, its earliest assumptions were uh, made in the greatest atmosphere of naivete, you see. The earliest assumptions are always the most naive assumptions because they occur uh, in the adolescent, in the adolescence or childhood of a discipline. So uh, science makes a number of assumptions which it is not willing to examine. Uh, one is that uh, the time when an experiment is performed is not a factor which should affect the results. In other words, if we say sulfur melts at a certain temperature, we don't have to add that it does that on Tuesdays and Thursdays and that on, an, on other days it melts at a different temperature. By making that assumption that time is an invariant quality, uh, science has precluded its ability to ever explain anything except phenomena which are of so low grade a organizational level that they are in fact invariant in time. This is why science has had such success explaining the behavior of, uh, first of all, inorganic matter and uh, in large and small aggregates, and much less success in biology, and to my mind, almost no success in psychology and theories of history and that sort of thing. So that's just one of the assumptions that scientists make, that temporal invariance, and of course what I've tried to say tonight is that everything is in flux, the whole philosophy that stands behind the I Ching and Pythagoreanism and all of that is a philosophy of eternal change. Uh, an, another, uh, well, when you actually study the philo uh, philosophy of science, what you learn is uh, two things. First of all, there's something called Gödel's uh, theor incompleteness theorem which people are not aware of, but certainly should be, because it bears centrally on the formation of ideas in the 20th century. Gödel was a mathematician who showed that in any formal system, including a mathematical system, it is possible to generate true statements which are not uh, uh, allowable by the formal laws within the system. In other words, no formal system can generate all true statements about itself. Well, what this means is that uh, the kind of truth which science has held as its holy grail for 2,000 years is in fact unattainable. And he showed this very clearly. Uh, people who work in fields where Gödel's theorem apply uh, are aware of this, but the general public is not. So n what you now learn when you study the philosophy of science is that the most that you can require of a system of explanation is that it be consistent unto itself. A theory of explanation which is consistent unto itself has arrived at the highest plane of uh, human 
uh, knowability. There is no meta-system which can look down at five self-consistent systems and say, well, A and B are true and C, D, and F are false. Well, uh, now astrology is a self-consistent, closed system of explanation, just like science is. But science will presume to judge astrology and dismiss it. And uh, we have all gotten into the habit of thinking that if you have an idea and you want to know whether it's true or not, you take it to scientists and lay it before them the way a cat lays a rat at its master's feet and then they, the scientists say yay or nay. But actually, uh, scientists are part of a priesthood and act to preserve their turf and very rarely point out that uh, if a system is self-consistent, that's as far as it can be taken. And uh, this is very important to remember. Sci what is not under attack here is reason. I'm very concerned to make the differentiation between science and reason because, and, and there is a tendency in modern society, and I'm sure there are speakers who have occupied this chair who have not felt the obligation to reason at all. You know, I mean, they're, they're operating in a realm where it's whatever you say it is as fast as you can think it up. And uh, <clears throat> that's not where I'm coming from. So I think science is a very, very important branch of art. And if we could get the scientists to admit that the ultimate criteria for deciding how a person shall uh, choose among competing explanatory systems is aesthetic. It's a matter of choice and taste. There is no higher arbiter of meaning.